Like all these advertising people think it's so important. Nobody cares about it. If I come to Cannes one day and I feel this is actually more interesting, more dynamic, more inspiring than the film festival, I'll have done something worthwhile. I didn't do very well at all at school. It wasn't until many, many, many years later when my son was diagnosed with dyslexia and I saw in him all of the traits that I had as well. He's seen the change from paper printing to the age of ads on screens and computers. Introducing Phil Thomas, chairman of Canned Lions and CEO of Essential Futures. And when you got sidelined, mm. you could have just gone, had a great career and now I don't. But re-strategize, use that time, thought about how you're gonna change things and did something about it. It's at that point I thought, if I'm gonna reinvent myself, it cannot be in this industry because this industry's screwed. Writing the email to everyone to say I'm leaving, one of the hardest things I've ever done because you've got to be honest. It's like I'm getting fired basically. Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. Hi, I'm Phil Thomas, and this is how I became the chair of Can Lions and the CEO of Essential. In the northeast of England, our guest was raised in Hull, to be exact. Despite having dyslexia, he taught himself how to spell, no staff or pointed hat. Breaking the mould of what was expected, he didn't follow his dad into academia, enjoying having fun, sports and photography. No wonder he found his way into ad and media. From articles and publications across the worlds of ad and creative, experiencing a career with its ups and downs and the key moments that have shaped him. He's seen the change from paper printing to the age of ads on screens and computers. Introducing Phil Thomas, Chairman of Canned Lions and CEO of Essential Futures. <laughs> very good. Very good. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy that. Yeah, it's brilliant. That is your life in, in a few seconds, but we're going to... Should we stop there? We could do, <laughs> but we're going to go into much more depth. We're going to tell the great story. How do you become CEO of uh, a company that... Well, Can Lines is a part of, which is an amazing awards festival of creativity for the industry. But uh, we were going to talk about the fact you're a CEO of Essential Futures, as Ashley said, but there is a change. What is that change? Well, Essential is going to split into two effectively. So part of the business is going to float on the US stock exchange, probably the NASDAQ. And the rest of it is going to stay on the London Stock Exchange and I'm going to be the CEO of that part. So that's the latest next move. Well, we will step into your journey from childhood to that point. But first, uh, CNBC described Can Lines as the Oscars of advertising, which is quite funny because you'd think they'd say it's the Can, <laughs> you know, film awards <laughs> yeah. advertising. But no, they said the Oscars. Yeah. Um, how would you describe Can Lines, of which you would chair, um, to somebody who isn't in advertising and doesn't know about it? That's a great question because it's quite hard to describe. I mean, people do call it the Oscars of advertising, but that's only the award part of it. We've obviously got quite a lot else there. So I think if you really, really strip everything back, what we do is we help businesses to be more creative. That's what we do because we believe that creativity drives growth for people, for businesses, for the planet. We believe that creativity is a really powerful force. So we do lots and lots and lots of things, but basically that is the heart of what we do. We help people to become more creative. And, you know, uh, it, there's, there's a conference element to it, but this is not pull up some banners and have a little booth. If you could paint the picture of someone walking through Cannes while the festival is on, what's that like? Well, it's funny, you know, because I've had quite a few bosses in my time running Can Lions, and one of the bosses arrived in the offices in London, and I was explaining the business to him. And uh, I said, look, the thing is, until you actually come to Can Lions itself, you won't really understand it. And he got really annoyed and said, listen, I can read a balance sheet, I can read a strategy document, 
I've seen the picture. I know. Don't tell me I don't understand this business. A few months later, he came to Can Lions. And the week after, he, we had a meeting and he said, you were right. I didn't understand it. So one of the issues is until you go, you can't quite picture it. Um, it's very big. So there are many, many, many thousands of people that go to it. About so 15,000 plus, right? Yeah, there's about 15,000 official uh, delegate delegates there but of course there are a lot of people that just go and don't actually register to be delegates they're kind wow. of like on the fringe probably 25 to thirty thousand people in the city wow. um and then it's every kind of person you know we have 190 countries go so you know the, it's a, like a global village so to speak so yeah. and it's i think the thing about it that's most striking is just the joy that it gives you because people are in such a good mood mm -hmm. you know they're there it's sunny it's the south of france so that's a bit of a tick <laughs> but actually they're also surrounded by people who are creative and interesting people from all over the world so there's a there's a sort of crackling energy to it that people find very very inspiring and i think if we had to write down how we people how we want people to feel when they're leaving can it would be inspired so we want them to leave Cannes and think, right, you know, I can do great things because I've seen this wonderful work. I've met these amazing people and I can go off and I, I, I've got a new lease of life. I kind of like love the industry again. Mm. Beautiful. And then again, to paint the picture, you know, we're on the beach and Google will have their beach section and WPP will be there and Twitter, Snapchat, Meta, you name it publicists i feel like i should say them all now <laughs> it would be difficult there's a lot of them <laughs> ipg yeah um and uh densu have us okay <laughs> we'll stop there um but there's a little backstory to it which I, I don't know if you could share with us about where it all began um because it is not um related to cam film festival which some people would know wouldn't know but it was inspired by Cannes Film Festival. It was, yeah, it was. So after the war, way back, Europe was pretty well in ruins. And amazingly now to think about it, the south of France was impoverished. And there was a little tiny fishing village called Cannes. And the mayor of Cannes thought, how the hell am I going to kind of pick this up now after this after we, it devastation of the Second World War? And he had this idea of a film festival which he launched very shortly after the second world war just to try and get people to come to the city to try to just invigorate a little bit and shortly after the film festival was launched the advertisers association of the cinema groups mm -hmm. thought to themselves look there's a festival here for the movies we should have a festival for the adverts that run before the movies mm -hmm. and if there's anyone listening from other parts of the world especially in the US it's not such a big thing to have ads before movies but obviously in Europe and in the UK it's a very big thing so they had their first festival it was actually in Venice it wasn't in Cannes it was in Venice mm. and they had 187 entries this year we'll have 26,000 so it's grown quite a lot so that was the really the the point of it was to say, look, we need to celebrate the creativity of the advertising as well as the movie themselves. And that's how it began. And then it, after three years or so, it moved to Cannes. Yes. And then it moved, it moved between Cannes and Venice for a while. In fact, we saw this hilarious document. <laughs> the organizers at the time were thinking about whether to move it to Cannes. Mm -hmm. And they were going through the reasons why Venice was the wrong place to have it. And some of the reasons really make sense, like it's quite difficult logistically. But it also said, you know, the thing about Venice is it's just really, really expensive. <laughs> Looking back now, the idea that Cannes was cheaper than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> so that's changed for sure. But the, uh, the city of Cannes were very, very encouraging. And um, it was actually in 1984 that it became full time in Cannes. I see. Yeah. And... The, the lion of can lines which is what the award is designed you know is designed to look like it is a line is based on the line in venice yeah the like if you if you're in venice you'll see it all over venice especially in saint mark's square but actually on many of the buildings in venice there's a winged lion 
and that was the original award. It was actually a winged lion. It, we changed the design in the 80s. I didn't, but they did. Yeah. Um, and that's what it was based on. It was based on all those lions in St. Mark's Square. I wish we'd asked you to bring one in. I know. That I've got one great. at home, actually. I could have brought it. We'll put it up. It'll, if you're watching this now, you can have a look. We'll put it up mm. on an image. Mm. Um, maybe you're sitting watching this and you've got one. That's pretty cool, too. Yeah, that would be pretty cool, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's essentially very one of the most prestigious awards you can get in the world of advertising and creativity. Mm. Um, so that's the story of Can and Can Lines, uh, which is very much related to your story. But we're going to step into, into your story. Um, and we're going to... Well, firstly, yeah, we're going to introduce you properly and just let people know that you're also chair of the Media Trust, which we'll talk about, a charity for marginalized groups in the media and creativity industry. And you're a member of the BBC Independent Advisory Board on the future of personalized media. Mm. Um, and uh, But let's step back in time to school and your life. And I've got a quote here that you shared with us, which is what your teacher said. He seems reasonably bright. He just needs to work harder. Was that true? <laughs> well, looking back on it, there was a reason behind that. So I went to quite a traditional school and it was quite an academic school. I didn't do very well at all at school. And the, re the reports that I got were consistently that they were he seems quite bright, but he's just got to work harder. But I was working as hard as I possibly could. I, I couldn't work out what they really meant. Mm. I was trying my very hardest. And um, it wasn't until many, many, many years later when my son was diagnosed with dyslexia. Uh, and I saw in him all of the traits that I had as well. And I thought, mm. it's just that it wasn't diagnosed. I mean, at the time, they didn't really care anyway. They just kind of left you to it. Um, but if I think if I'd been tested back in the day, I would definitely have been, I would have been described as dyslexic because that, that's all, all of the traits he had is exactly what I had. What happened when you started to realize that, oh, after all this time, maybe I had dyslexia too. Did you share it with someone? Did you, what was? I, I did a lot of reading about it. I mean, I actually see it as a gift actually. And I talk to my son about this all the time because uh, everybody's different, of course, mm -hmm. but dyslexic people have got a slightly different way of looking at things. And I think if you lean into that mm -hmm. and you kind of try and really um, maximize the benefit of that, then you can see it as a as a gift. At the time, at school, of course, it was a actually the complete opposite of a gift because I was just left behind. I just didn't understand half the stuff was that was being told to me. So you, I mean, so school was tough because the school you were at, as you said, was very academic. And then you get to a point, it's time for college, and you go, right, enough of this academic stuff. I'm going to unleash my creativity and do a photography um, course degree yeah. um, at college and, uh, and finally be recognized for your great talents and parents will be proud and everything will go great. How did it go? Well, you know, I think one of the things that people don't often acknowledge is that most of the things that have got you to where you've got to are completely out of your control mm. and so, so when people say that they they've got to where they've got to because they've worked really hard or they've or they're really bright or whatever it is they're really missing so much of the point because it's down to luck it's down to your genes it's down to your parents it's down to you know, I believe like 90% of it is mm. complete luck. And the way to argue that is if somebody says that's not true, you must have worked really hard to get where you've got to. I just say, well, let's play a little thought game, right? So let's imagine that I was born in the same year as I was born in, but I was born in South Sudan. Mm. Do you think I would be the chair of Can Lions if I'd been born in South Sudan in the same time as I was born? The chances are quite limited, aren't they? Yeah. So the idea that you you should be really proud of where you've got to because of your own accomplishments, I think, is a real blind spot for a lot of people. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of it's luck. So the reason I say that is because my father had got out of poverty 
real genuine grinding poverty in the post-war years through education. And he'd actually ended up, he'd gone from, his dad was killed in the war and he was, he was very, very, very poor. But he'd gone, he managed to get to Oxford and he had an academic degree. So he, he had kind of escaped through education. Yeah. And um, therefore, when I went to him and said, look, I don't seem to be that good at the, uh, the academic side of things and I want to do photography, you could see how that could have been a real problem. Yeah. And he might have really discouraged me from doing that. And then I would have gone to university, to a third-rate university, done a third-rate degree and not been very happy. Mm. But instead of that, he actually encouraged me to do it. So that's why I say it's just luck because that had nothing to do with me. It was just I have, had the right parents. Yeah. And they said, fine, off, you know, you want to do photography? <laughs> Good luck to you. Off you go. So so I did instead of going to uni. Excellent. Yeah, I had a similar similar experience when I was choosing where I was going to go and what I was going to do. It was with my grandmother. Traditionally, you know, and West Indian grandmother would want their children, if they go to university, to be a doctor, lawyer, those kind of things that are seen a certain way. I said, I'm going to do film. And she said, mm, okay, then if that's what you want to do, go and do it, kind of, you can have my blessing. And it all came back after a while where I was able to film a family, or a family funeral that she wasn't able to attend. And I kind of said, that's why I do it. And it mm. really kind of came full circle of why, you know, I did what I did at that time. Yeah, good for you. It's good when you get that encouragement, isn't it? And the kind of, when it all connects and comes back to one. Mm. Mm. So you get the encouragement and it's your chance, to, as I said, you know, to do something that you are, you finally found your thing and good at, go and do photography. And how did it go? Well, the problem was it wasn't that good, is it? <laughs> so, you know, so, so I went to, and then I was immediately surrounded by people who were really good at it. Mm -hmm. And then you think, oh my God, this is going to be really difficult because with photography, you've got to, being really talented is just, that's just table stakes. And then you've got to build on that as well. So I tried for a while to be a photographer. Uh, the competition's fierce. It's really, and actually even now, now it's even harder. I'm not sure how anyone manages to do it, but at the time, even at the time it was very, very difficult. But I try. I became a photographer anyway. So I've, I've en I ended up in Africa taking pictures for charities, and when I was there, I was with this older guy, sort of mentoring me, and we go to the same place. He'd take his load of pictures. I would take my load of pictures. His pictures were so much better, and I was like, "We're in the same place. How is this <laughs> happening?" But while I was there, I started to uh, write articles because I thought, when I get back, I'm gonna. I try and sell the photos but also write articles and so I started to write articles and that's when I realized at last I've got some kind of talent in that area and then I became a writer I mean for someone hearing that for the first time you you let us know now that back then you were probably dyslexic but you were writing great articles so how does that work to the person who doesn't know much about dyslexia and, and how it works how was it not difficult well yeah it was so the two points first is there are different levels of dyslexia so there are people who literally can look at a page of text and all the letters are almost like floating in the air they can't actually make head or tail of it mm. but there's obviously different degrees of severity so mm. i was on the less severe side but i i remember at college i used to write to my parents because in those, in those days we had these things called letters and stamps <laughs> and I used to write to my parents and my mum used to send the letters back with all the corrections oh. on how to spell properly. And when I got the job as a writer, I, I realized I've just got to really, really commit myself to learning stuff like that. And I really just worked incredibly hard at it that, that must have been a challenge especially like kind of you know outside of your kind of school years you know you're you're an adult you're out there and you're now learning you know to spell you know consistently yeah no it's really difficult and of course you didn't have spell checkers then mm -hmm. um I'm aging myself a bit but we had typewriters <laughs> so you know it was it was quite difficult at the time but um eventually it came it, eventually you I did a lot of reading about how to write and 
I did, you know, I just worked really hard at it. Mm. So before you got your first job, there was a period of unemployment. Yeah. How was that for you, sort of emotionally going through that? I think when you go through that, the looking back at the time, it was harder. But looking back, what you can tell yourself is, look, this is going to be okay. At the time, you're not sure it's going to be okay. And how old are you at this time? When you're in 22, 23, something like that. No real career path. No idea what I was going to do. Are you concerned about life? At this Very, point? yeah. Very concerned. Do you remember what was going through your mind? I just didn't know. I had all sorts of dreams. You know, I was going to... At the time, The Independent was the newspaper. I was mm. going to work for The Independent. I was going to do this. I was going to do that. But they were all just dreams. The thing I've learned over the years is that actually everything usually works out okay. If you can try and control your anxiety <laughs> by telling yourself, I've been okay up until now, it's in all likelihood I'll be okay in the future as well. That's what I would have told myself at the time. But I think when you're younger, it's much harder because you just think, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. <laughs> I haven't got any qualifications to speak of. You know, my photography was, I got a city and guilds in that. I mean, that's all I had. No idea what to do. So it was quite scary. What did you do? <laughs> it obviously worked out. We're going to get to that. But what, what did you do? What was next? I saw an ad for a writer on a magazine, on a photography magazine. And I thought, well, I know a little bit about photography. Mm -hmm. And I've got a few things published by that point. So I'd, I'd got some articles published. So I had some published work. And I went for the job, and by some miracle, I got it. So I then became a professional writer. Excellent. Mm. How does that feel then? You, you've you've landed a job in in a in an industry that you you wanted to be in. Kind of, what did that do for you personally? Uh, it was absolutely fantastic because it was just a joy uh, to do something that you really like. You know, I won quite a few awards as well. Excellent. Which actually goes back sort of full circle to the Can Lions conversation we had a bit earlier. Mm. You know, why are awards important to creative people? If you're producing something creative, it's so difficult to prove you're any good at it. Yeah. Because it's just opinion, isn't it? And that's why the Oscars are so powerful as a tool. Yeah. Because if, if, if something wins an Oscar, that means it's people are thinking it's really good mm. and it's the same with lions it's like if you're a creative in an agency how are you supposed to say you're any good because it's yeah. all just like totally subjective whereas what the lions do is they give a kind of affirmation mm. so when i started to win writing awards i thought that's an external affirmation that i must be reasonable at it and then i just really enjoyed it and what was the path so you, you got your first first job was it at the guardian uh, I was writing for The Guardian, uh, but then I started writing for photography magazines. And then um, I sort of worked my way up and I eventually became the editor of a movie magazine called Empire Magazine. And though, though, yeah, they were great years. That's a really great job, being editor of Empire Magazine. I loved it so much that, believe it or not, I used to go to bed at night and I used to wish I could be asleep because the next thing I would know would be I'd be waking up to go to work. Amazing. <laughs> Can you believe that? That's how much I love my job when I was editor of Empire. That sounds great. What yeah. was perks? What was fun about it? Mm. Well, you've got this train set of a, a very successful magazine that people really liked about movies that people really like. Mm. Um, you can choose the most interesting interviews. So, so if you're the editor, you just commission yourself to do the most interesting interviews. <laughs> um, and you can just create this thing uh, that wasn't in the world before you started working yeah. on it, and then it is in the world, and people are. I remember we went to, I went to a football match once, a really big match. There were like sixty thousand people there, and I thought, wow, we sell like twice as many as this every month. That's a hell of a lot of people. Yeah. So that gives you a nice feeling as well. Mm. And uh, Empire, what, what was it part of? Who who owned who owned it? So it was owned by a company called EMAP that was the most innovative magazine company at the time. So they they had smash hits, they had Q Magazine, Mojo Magazine, L and Red and lots and lots of others. Mm -hmm. And they launched, I was part of the team that launched Empire. So you're doing great at Empire. You've, in about three years, you go from being there at the start of when it launched to editor. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, 
And you're winning awards by this point? Did you say? Yeah, won lots of awards, yeah. Great. Uh, so things are going great. Living the dream, going to sleep, can't wait for work the next day. Isn't this a wonderful life? And then someone new comes in and everything sort of takes a turn. Tell us what happened. Well, what happened was um, it's, it's quite interesting for creative people to think about, actually. Things are a little bit different now, but at the time you kind of reached a ceiling as a creative person in this in the in media so i was the editor of a magazine and the the job above that was a publisher of a magazine mm -hmm. and they came to me and they said do you want to be the publisher of some magazines you know including empire mm -hmm. do you want to stop being editor and become publisher and i just had a young family and that was the way to make more money and to sort of move on up and I remember uh, there was a very cynical or smart, I suppose you could say, editorial director at the time. And when he heard this was going to happen, he said, oh, brilliant. There you go. There's the company taking a great editor and turning them into a mediocre publisher. Because his point was, you know, surely we, there must be ways to incentivize creative people to carry on being creative. Yeah. But I, I, I became a publisher and I published various magazines and then we bought FHM, which is a men's magazine. Um, and I was managing director of that and publisher of that. And so I moved into the business side after that. So for, for those that don't know that are listening or watching, what, what are the differences between an ed editor and a publisher? So an editor is responsible for the, for the um, editorial output. So the, the, basically the words and the pictures mm. in a magazine. And a publisher is responsible for the advertising and all of the costs and the business of the magazine. Mm -hmm. So it's like much more holistic. You're kind of running, you're running it as a business. Yeah. Whereas if you're an editor, you're basically running it for pure quality. Mm -hmm. And you should have some sense of commercial nous, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to, mm -hmm. to be a creative person. And we should say at this point that EMAP, the company you joined, how old were you when you, you became? I was 23. 23 emap is what we now know as as essential yeah which you are now ceo of yeah which is pretty cool so you joined at 23 and you have risen up all the ranks to become ceo which we'll get to that first but yeah interesting as people hear the story to know that this is is the same company you're now ceo well how does that feel uh well it's it's it took me a long time <laughs> you know it's nice it's a nice arc but I do this little presentation that I do enjoy doing. It's called How to Manage Your Career. And I do it for young people on, in the business. Yeah. One of the things I say in it is my advice is to always say yes to stuff. So, I mean, in your work life, this is. Right? In your private life, maybe saying yes to everything is not necessarily the wisest thing to do. There are many things you should say no to in your private life. In work, I find or have found, you just say yes to stuff. And what you don't do is you don't then caveat that with, well, hang on a minute, what does that mean? How much money does that mean I'm gonna earn? And mm -hmm. what about my job title? And you know, asking for all the sort of really annoying details. I think if you just say yes to stuff, then you become like a, a radiator in the business and people think, well, they'll they'll give it a go. They'll, you know, they'll just, so, Really what I've done is I've just kind of hung around even through some really tough times until an opportunity has arisen. And I've, most of the time I've just said, go on then. I mean, there are some things I've said no to, but most of the time it's like, go on then, yeah, why not? What was one of those where you really thought, you, you know, you've, you've said yes and you thought, oh, I don't know about this actually. Are there any that sort of you were really unsure of but just had to dive in? Yeah, I mean, I think when I was, I was, so I was running the business in Australia. We had, uh, EMAP had a business in Australia and Southeast Asia and I was running that. Mm -hmm. And they said, do you want to come back to run a bigger bit of EMAP? Lots of people, it's like really important, lots of money, lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, based in Peterborough. <laughs> so, I, so I went from Sydney to Peterborough and I left Sydney in January, which as we all know is the height of their summer. Mm -hmm. 
and arrived in Peterborough in January, which, as we all know, is the depths of winter. It's not really and, the Gold Coast. It's not really the Gold Coast. <laughs> no. And that was a time when I stared out at the... There was snow coming down on the car park. And I just thought, Jesus Christ, what have I done? Are you an agency or brand that would like to work with our production company, Unity and Motion? If so, contact us at unityandmotion.com. We produce commercials and social content for brands such as Chanel, Amazon, Reebok, Harrods, The Ritz, and many more. Now back to the show. That's the other thing I say, you know, it's really so important when you're starting out your career or you're just starting in management to understand that it's not a linear thing. You think, oh, I know what's going to happen. I'm just going to go up, 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 and it's going to be great. And it never works like that. You have real dips. And I've had lots of real dips in my career. Let's talk about that. You were an assistant editor at one point, and you described the experience of what it was like to get ousted by somebody. Mm. Tell us about that. Well, it's um, it's really hard, isn't it, when you... I've been moved on a number of times. You know, I've been... People have been appointed above me when I thought I should have got that job. Um, I've been gently moved out of businesses and sort of put on the sidelines. This is what I mean. It's like when you read somebody's LinkedIn profile or they, or you're listening to a podcast, quite often it's like, oh, it's great. You know, I just went up and up and up and now it's all good. <laughs> and it's never true. It's never true. So I've really had some times when you just think, God, now what do I do? What did, what was it like? when? So, and just describe what happened. You lose, you lose self-confidence really quickly, I think, mm. because you tr you always, it's a bit like I was at school, you know, you're always trying your hardest. Or you should be anyway. That's my advice to people is just try your hardest. Mm. You try to remain positive. So you try to be, you know, as I put it, you try to be a hand raiser, not a finger pointer. You try to be a radiator, not a drain. <laughs> I love that. You know, you try to be decent. And then it's just not working out. And th those are tough times, really, really difficult times. Um, what I've found, though, sometimes is when people have come in above me and I've just thought, I don't think, I think I've got more talent than them. So you try and look at it. You try and be honest with yourself. And you go, hang on, I'm pretty sure I've got more talent than them. Then what, I, you, <laughs> what I've done in the past is I just wait. And usually it comes good. Yeah. You became, so you said, you became managing director of EMAP Australia. Yeah. How did how does it come about to get, is that your first managing director role? Yeah, it was. How does it come about to become a managing director? What was the scenario for you? What was the story there? Well, I'd done quite well in my previous job. I was running FHM and it was going absolutely crazy. We couldn't print enough copies. Wow. Do you remember those days or are you too young? Yeah, I, I remember those days. Sixth yeah. form. FHM was like the premium. We sometimes get the nuts of the zoo because they're a little bit cheaper. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I published zoo for a while as well. Yeah. Um, but FHM, we literally could not print enough coffee, like enough copies. And we, they used to come in every month and say, what, should, you know, should we add another 100,000 to the print run? And I'm like, I don't know. Go on then. Wow. And then we just sell out completely. I mean, it was an amazing moment. I mean, looking back on it, it was all a bit, you know, in the modern context, mm -hmm. a little bit close to the wind. But it was hugely successful. And we published it throughout the world as well. So we published it in 30 different countries. I think when you have that success, you can then build on it. So then they were looking for a managing director in Australia and they offered me the job. And were you a bit nervous about taking your first MD role and also having to move across to the other side of the world? Yeah, I think, uh, well, moving to the other side of the world was an interesting decision because we actually, my wife and I, we had young children at the time. We had a long walk around Highgate Woods. We were like, should we take this job? Should we move to Australia? And I said to her as we were walking around, I said, when we're on our deathbed, do you think we'll say, do you remember that time we decided not to go to Australia? <laughs> Wasn't that brilliant? <laughs> and... When you put it like that, yeah, that's why I just say yes all the time. Mm -hmm. And like, what's the worst that can happen? It's not. And when they were interviewing me, they actually said, because um, by the way, these jobs, uh, I had to interview for them all. They didn't just give, give me the jobs. And when they were interviewing me for this, they said, um, so listen, we have to ask you, if we were interviewing you now for the CEO of our division in Poland, 
based in Warsaw, would you still be interested? Or are you going because it's Australia? Ooh. So obviously you've got to you've got to say, of course I'd be interested in going to Warsaw brackets. Absolutely no way. But you know, it's not a difficult decision to go to, to move to Australia. But it was in Australia that when you when you're then managing lots of different brands, that's when you're kind of shifting into more of a C a proper CEO MD role, as somebody would accept it. And that's where you have to just run things really differently and that's where i started to learn about how to run a bigger business mm. with lots of people in it because how did you find the md role because from our experience of talking to a lot of different people that seems to be one of the most challenging roles for for, for most i don't think it's the most challenging right so so if you, so so in, in most businesses there are there are leaders who are running a product and they've got a great job so let's say you're running can lions or you're running Empire Magazine, or you're running it, whatever it is. That's a brilliant job. And then you've got the CEO or the MD of the whole thing, who in a way is running their own product because they can make decisions and they can they can morph it and they can change it. And that is also a great job. The most difficult, most challenging job, I think, is the divisional leader. Mm. So you've got a divisional leader who's got maybe three or four brands underneath them or three or four divisions underneath them. They've got a CEO above them and they've got the product people actually running the brands below them. And that job is really difficult because how do you add value? And you, you can spend a lot of time just drifting around. Yeah, a lot of variables. With yeah, that kind of I often wonder whether those jobs are even worth having in an organization, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It depends on the size of the organization. But they're the difficult jobs. I think when you're actually, you've got a train set and you're running a business and you're the boss of it. I, I personally think that's much easier, especially if you're a control freak like I am. For anyone watching, listening, who's currently in that role now that you said is is the hardest, yeah. what advice would you share on on based on your experience of going through it? I think you've got to you've got to work out where can I add the most value, and you've got to partner with the people below you and the people above you. So if you can find a way to sort of partner with the CEO on certain things and be part of that creation of the business, and then you partner with the product people as well without getting in the way, um, and try and avoid, avoid having numerous meetings and wasting everybody's time, um, because quite often you're just a conduit of information. Yeah, You're taking information from the product people and you're passing it upstairs to the board, and it's quite soul-destroying really. So you've got to try and find a role for yourself and that could be i'm going to be involved i'm going to really focus on innovation and new launching or m a or you know something that you can make your own otherwise it can be a little bit soul destroying i think and when you say partner with the ceo or partner with the teams what, what do you mean so you could say to the ceo look you've got lots of stuff to worry about why don't i take this bit off you and that you know that'll be whatever bit you find interesting mm -hmm. Why don't I take this bit off you and then I'll report into you so you don't have to do everything. Or you say to the people running the product, you know, um, you don't have time. Maybe it's, I don't know, you don't have time to spend with customers as much as you'd like. Why don't I do some of that? You know, or whatever it is that you find interesting. So I think it's important to to find a role for yourself. Yeah, put yourself at the forefront of being able to get that data as well. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. Great advice. Okay, so you're, you, you've done Australia, then you moved to... M moved back to Peterborough. Back to Peterborough. <laughs> Bad move. And what were you doing there? Peterborough? So I was running a whole load of magazines and websites and events around uh, cars and motorbikes. So you're MD of EMAP Automotive. Yeah, that's right. Cool. 2003. Yeah. What happens next? So that didn't go very well. So I then got sidelined again. Again, so a second time you're getting sidelined. Yeah, and I've been sidelined a bit. So that business was not going well. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, here we go again. Yeah. Do I, are you thinking, maybe I have to leave this organization? Yeah. What was that like? What was going through your mind? So they came to me and they said, this isn't going very well, which I knew. Yeah. What wasn't going well though? The problem, I mean, looking back on it, one of the things I say to people is, if you want to try and be successful, it is a little bit cynical to say it, but it's really, really important to choose an industry 
that is on the up. Mm, yeah. So, for instance, magazines in the 2000s, not a great industry to join because it's not on the up. Um, and there are many, many examples, of course. I think it's so important because it goes back to my argument about a lot of things are out of your control. Yeah. And when I was running the automotive business, the fact of the matter is digital disruption was absolutely crucifying magazines. And we weren't responding to it as incumbents. We weren't responding mm -hmm. to it correctly. I, there was very little I could have done, really, looking back on it. At the time, you blame yourself a little bit. But being in magazines at that point, very questionable. You had to get out. So I couldn't do anything with these businesses. And as it happened, nor could anyone else because my successes didn't really work out either. But at that point, I thought, right, magazines are really compromised. I've got 30 more years of my career. What am I going to do? So I basically sat down and thought, what do I believe won't be digitally disrupted in the same way that I've got access to? And I realized that events were that because I couldn't see a way that face-to-face -face physical human connection could be digitized very quickly. I thought, I think events have got real longevity, yeah. whereas magazines are screwed. And you're, are you having these thoughts and, and thinking it through? This is why you're sidelined, is it? Uh, well, I get sidelined because the business isn't going very well. Okay. <laughs> when they said, look, you've got to just, we'll, we'll park you. They parked me somewhere to go and sit in a room rather than fire me. They just parked me somewhere. But the, my career was going nowhere. Wow. Yeah. So What's your I, title then? Did they give you a different title? They gave me a different title. They gave me some magazines to run. That was it. Was it was a non job really? Is that not really disheartening? Incredibly, yeah. Because you've gone from this position. Yeah. And you had you were flying in Australia, and now it's looking like your career's going down with magazines. Yeah, absolutely. In yeah. Peterborough, of all places. In Peterborough. in Peterborough, and writing the writing the email to everyone to say I'm leaving was was a hard, one of the hardest things I've ever done because you've got to be honest. It's like I'm getting fired, basically. Good luck, everyone. I'm off. I've just been fired. It's really hard. But when they sidelined me and they put me in a room somewhere doing a non-job, it's at that point I thought, if I'm going to reinvent myself, it cannot be in this industry because mm. this industry is screwed. And that's a big piece of advice I would give anybody in any industry now is to try to be really clear on the implications of technology. So I know everyone goes on about AI at the moment, but depending on your role, I think understanding or trying to understand the power and the implications of AI is unbelievably important. I talk to my kids about this all the time. So anyway, so I thought, well, magazines are screwed, so what isn't going to be screwed? And I thought events probably not going to be screwed. So what did you do about it? So I then... Uh, contacted, I was on the B2C side, so I was doing magazines for consumers, mm -hmm. but we also had a very large B2B division. So I thought, I thought two things. First is B2C is going to be massively disrupted. It was just at the beginning-ish of genuine digital disruption, and I thought anything B2C is going to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. All magazines are going to be disrupted. So... I need to look for events in the B2B space. So I then contacted the guy that ran our B2B division. And I said, you know me, I used to run Australia. I used to do this, that, and the other. I'm not a complete wreck. It's not all over yet. I've still got something to give. Can, we, can I come and have a conversation? And that's how it eventually, they gave me can lines to run. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a big position. Yeah. Yeah which for someone who's been sidelined in the business for not performing well even though yeah it's not your fault magazines were going downhill yeah what well, it seems how did that happen so i think it's the realization that sometimes you have to go either sideways or even down so i said to this guy have you got any jobs because i've got this non job over here at the moment and i'm not enjoying it so he had a little portfolio of businesses some of them were data businesses. Some of them were kind of magazine-y type things for B2B yeah. in the media space. 
And he said, I'm looking for someone to run this. So I said, I'm your man. <laughs> and it was a pretty, it was pretty ordinary, actually. I mean, I, it was not stellar, but I realized that sometimes you've got to go down and wait it out. Yeah. And what happened was I was running that little set of businesses. We bought Can Lions. Ah. While you were there? While I was there. Well, um, how, how were you involved in that? I wasn't involved in that. Okay. So I was watching this from afar. Right. We bought it. What was your job title at this time? I was the managing director of what they called EMAP Media. So it was, it was um, a broadcast magazine, Screen International, those kind of B2B magazines for media, for TV, film, that sort of advertising. And this was a down step from what you were doing before? Yeah, it was much smaller. Right. Much smaller. And who makes the decision to buy Can Lines? So that was the uh, that was part of the B two B bit. So kind of associated with me, but like a different lot of people bought it. They appointed, and this has happened a number of times in my career. I'm talking about waiting it out. So they appointed yeah. a CEO, and she didn't work out. So well, what are you thinking at this time? Well, I could well, do. Well, that funny well. enough, I'm I'm not sure what I'm thinking, but the. But the bosses rang me and they said, look, just so you know, we've had to let her go. So we haven't got a leader for Canline that's at the moment. Just How They were just informing me, really. Mm -hmm. How long was she in the role? She was there only about a year. Yeah. And I said, um, I sort of said, well, look, if you need me to do anything, let me know. And they basically, after many, by the way, many, many, many interviews, they decided to give it to me. And it was interesting because I knew nothing about advertising really and I'd never run an event before. So you're, you've now got this position. What do you do to get yourself clued up and ready to thrive in this new position that you've got? The people we bought it off, Roger Hatchuel, he, he'd created it. He'd, he'd really done the blueprint and he'd mm -hmm. taken it to where it got to. So he created can lines as he was involved at the very beginning and he, he basically built the whole thing. Yeah, he, the model was his model really. So we stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, when I do the history of the festival for new starters, I say you've got, got to know about what happened before because these people created something amazing yeah. and all we're doing is building on it. Um, but there was a, uh, a guy running it for Roger who stayed on for a while and I just tried to learn as much from him as possible. And I think that's where, you know, you learn... People talk about humility, but I think, I think it's really underrated, actually, humility from a leadership perspective. I was listening to a great podcast with Hillary Clinton, and she's, the, she was asked, what is the, what's the secret of being a great president? Because you, you've watched a lot of presidents. And she said, um, it's this combination of having the confidence to make decisions, but the humility to ask questions and listen to the answer. And... I knew nothing about advertising and nothing about events and I had so much to learn and the only way to learn was to ask questions mm -hmm. and be really humble. And I, I knew so little, you know, but you know, the alphabet soup of advertising agencies like DDB, BBDO and all. I literally kept getting, I could partly think it's my dyslexia, kept getting them mixed up. And I remember I went to see, I went to, for a meeting in New York with the the, with the then chief executive of DDB. And I was talking to him about all the things they'd done at Cannes last year and all the awards they'd won and how great they were. But I was talking about BBDO, not DDP. <laughs> I just got, just got it mixed up in my head. Did they say how, anything? No, they, he was such a nice guy. Oh. He was just letting me, <laughs> letting me go on. But yeah, you just have to really, really just, I don't know anything. <laughs> just learn, try and learn as much as possible. And just a little bit of info, info it's interesting, is that, um, so 2004, EMAP PLC bought Can Lines yeah. um, from French businessman Roger Hatsuel mm -hmm. for a reported 52 million. Yeah. And so, so yeah, they take it on and you get the opportunity to become CEO of Can Lines. Yeah. And what was the first period like in that role were you feeling it was like, really great my career is back on track yeah let's go it was it was it sort of taught me again the importance of and it sounds like such a cliche but having some kind of a an understandable vision 
Mm. So I had been to Cannes for the film festival for many, many, many years, right? So when I was editor of Empire, I'd go to the film festival. And when I took over Cannes Lions, everybody in the industry talked it up as this massively important festival. It's like our festival, it's our global event. Cannes Lions is so, such a big deal. And the first year I went, I was expecting the film festival. Mm -hmm. Now the film festival is so massive that just opposite the Palais in Cannes, there are all these incredibly posh shops like Chanel and all these posh shops. And I'd been to the film festival for 10 years and there were so many people at the film festival that I didn't even realize that this row of shops even existed wow. because of the crowds. Wow. So you go to Cannes Lions on my first year and it's like, there's lots of shops there and I can see them because this is really small. Where's all the Everyone's people? going on about how big it is. Yeah. What year is this? 2006. Right. So I, so I then thought, this is not important. Like all these advertising people think it's so important. Nobody cares about it. So I then thought, I wonder if I can turn this into something that has genuine cultural importance mm. and uh, of scale, something of scale where they aren't just advertising people talking to each other, but actually the world is coming to discuss stuff. And it was that, that then once you painted that quite simple vision, it's not about business. It's not about, you know, it's not, it's just something in my mind anyway, that I could really relate to and understand. It's like, if I come to Cannes one day and I feel this is actually more interesting, more dynamic, more kind of inspiring than the film festival, then I'll have done, I'll have done something worthwhile. And I just had that as my, as my North Star. So what did you do about it? How did you bring that into reality? Well, I think the first thing was just to realize where we are. You know, let's be honest about where we are. This is actually a really small business. There were 17 people working on it when I joined. What we've got here is a massive brand, but a really small business. Yeah. And also just like this event, like no one cares. So I thought, well, we've just got to attract much more diverse people. You know, we've got to get the brands have got to come, the platforms have got to come, all the media people have got to come, you know, and eventually it was music, film. And now... I think anybody that goes to the film festival and then comes to Cannes Lions would say ours is a much more interesting event because we've got everybody there. We've got all the film, all the film companies are there, mm -hmm. all Hol Hollywood's there, and that's just part of it. So we, it's just built into something really, really interesting. Objective okay. achieved. You did it. <laughs> yes, it's pretty did. cool. So it's been a rocky road though. Yeah, it hasn't been plain sailing. Uh, Tell us about some of the, I mean, it seems like every year you, there's challenges to, to deal with. Yeah. 2010, for example. How was 2010 can lines? Well, yeah, 29 and 2010. So we had obviously the, goal, the, the global financial crisis, which was absolutely. But I mean, th I think the broader picture here is that you, um, the thing about can lines is that everybody feels they own it. And probably quite rightly, they feel they're, they own it. And I haven't got a problem with that at all. Why do you think they feel that way? Because they feel it's their festival. I mean, I've actually had meetings with people where I've said to them, for instance, well, what happens sometimes is businesses come into the city of Cannes and they sort of, they set up shop mm. and they, they have an activation. And I ha we have to talk to them about that and say, this is our business. You know, you can't just do that. And I've had meetings with people who say, what somebody owns can lions we didn't know any we just thought it was we didn't know anyone actually owns it so i think people feel that they own it and i think that's great but the negative of that is that everybody has got an opinion about it and those opinions are often based on a lack of data a lack of understanding or their own biases mm -hmm. so it's very contentious so what we do is very, very high profile. And so we come into for a lot of criticism. So we've obviously had the problems of the global financial crisis, but we've got problems of all, all sorts of other. We're kind of like a big beacon for the industry. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that goes across the whole piece, you know, so diversity, inclusion, sustainability, the value of awards, how much we charge, how expensive it is in Cannes. All, all of those issues are constantly on debate. It, after the financial crisis, there was a volcano in Iceland. Yeah. That disrupted airspace everywhere. Yeah. Including Can Line. What was going on and what were you having to deal with? Well, it's funny because I, I, it was only when I started running an event that I realized something that actually is quite helpful in life as well, which it's amazing I hadn't worked this out before. <laughs> but basically, I spent my first two or three years at Can really quite stressed. Mm -hmm during the event itself, really stressed about everything that was going wrong because it's very complicated business, very complicated event, really lots of different moving parts. And I got really stressed running it. And then it was after about three years, I suddenly thought, oh my God, it's not actually about things going wrong because things are going to go wrong. So I, I went from fighting against things going wrong and hoping they wouldn't go wrong to accepting that they're going to go wrong and then just working out what I'm going to do about it, which is mentally a completely different place to be. And of course, for life, that's not a bad message either. You can go through life thinking, I really hope nothing bad's going to happen. <laughs> hope everybody I know lives forever and nobody gets ill and there's no sadness and I don't fall off a curve and a curb and break my ankle. Something's going to always go wrong. And that lifted the pressure a lot. It's just like, what are you going to do about it? That's all that matters. Um, yeah. And what did you do when do about it when, so, so could nobody fly into Cannes that year? Uh, we panicked and they lifted the ban about two weeks before. There were a lot of events that were really badly affected, but they, they lifted it by then. That worked out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've, he told us a story about a juror who couldn't, he was on the jury for, for the awards and couldn't get to Cannes. And they went through extreme measures to get there. What happened? Yeah, so that was one of the years when there was a strike. Um, a strike of what? Planes. There were various uh, airport strikes throughout Europe. And... This juror managed to, uh, I can't believe it, it's actually true, this story, but there were very few flights leaving. I think it was Copenhagen. And he managed to persuade the airline to let him on the plane and sit in the cockpit. <laughs> now, this is a particularly charismatic individual. So when you're thinking about this story, you're thinking, that's it, that can't possibly be true, but he's very, very persuasive. You've got to be this really silk. handsome Danish guy, really mm. charismatic. He persuaded them to get on the plane, and he sat in the cockpit all the way from Copenhagen to Nice, um, which gave you some idea of how 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 much people enjoy being on the jury and how important it is to them. And you've had cans being disrupted by the French taxi strike against Uber, when that was a big thing back yeah. in 2015. Yeah, people not being able to go home. Yeah. I guess it's not the worst thing in the world being stuck in Cannes. <laughs> and you touched on it there. 2017, how do you find out the news that publicists are saying we're not coming? That was a real moment. We were actually in Cannes itself. It was the first morning, I think. And I got a call saying the CEO of Publicist wants to have a word with you in, in his hotel, in, in the Majestic Hotel. And who are publicists, for those who don't know? Publishers is now, I think it's fair to say, the world's largest by revenue, um, or certainly number two by revenue, of uh, advertising, marketing, media organization. So they have advertising agencies, data agencies, mm -hmm. media agencies. Revenue's in the... In the billions, yeah. In so the over 10, billions. 15 billion in this region. Yeah, yeah, huge, huge businesses. Tens and tens of thousands of employees. Mm -hmm. And, and I suppose it's interesting because we'll get on to what happened, but they basically pulled out of Cannes. And for them, the cost of Cannes is quite small, really, because they're a huge company. Mm -hmm. it wasn't but what so much... would they spend? What would they be spending on? Well, we, it's hard for us to calculate because they've got all their hotel costs and flight costs that we don't, we don't calculate. But, you know, it's probably a few million euros, something like that. And they're a multi-billion mm. dollar business. 
So it's not so much about the cost. It was more about, I think, the the message they wanted mm. to send. So I got this message saying, CEO of Publicis wants to see you in the, he wants a meeting in the Majestic, which is just across from where I sit in the Palais, in my office in the Palais. And uh, we went across and he said, look, he'd only just taken over. We're now quite close. He's, he's, he's you know, we're, we're friends now. But at the time, he'd only just taken over and he was sitting with his senior executive team and he said, we've made a decision to pull out of Cannes next year, by which we mean we're not going to enter anything and we're not going to come. What's going through your mind? What I'm thinking is, I really hope that this doesn't escalate. Because once one of them does it, I, that was my biggest fear. It's like, the others will either react and double down and say, We'll have their tickets. Yeah, you're <laughs> yeah, so space. wrong. You've got it so wrong. Yeah. So in the back of my head, I was just thinking, I really hope they say that. The other way they could have gone was, do you know what? He's got a point. I think mm. we'll pull out as well. There's the big four sort of holding companies, WPP, Interpublic Group, Densu, and... Om Omnicom as well. And Omnicom. Omnicom yeah. yeah. Five. Five. Big five. And so if, if, if they were all to pull out, what would that mean for Can Lines? Uh... It would mean the awards themselves, because what I say is the people who come, people who come to Cannes think, oh, there's lots of, there's Google and there's Facebook and there's, ooh, there's Spotify and there's all these amazing. So is this the new world? And in a way it is the new world, but you've got to remember the awards, the actual work, which is the most important thing, the actual creative work, 90% of it is done by those, by advertising agencies you know, for a broad, a broad spectrum. And of that work, about 50% of it is done by those big five. So they're incredibly important. So it would have really been a massive problem if they'd pulled out. So what happened? I said something to him that I think irritated him at the time, which was, have you got any idea how much your people are going to hate this decision? <laughs> it's not <laughs> the thing to say. statement. Uh, it's not the thing more. to say to Arthur. Um, he didn't like that very much, which is fair enough. Um, <laughs> what was his response? Uh, he kind of glowered at me a bit. But, I mean, I think I was right. I don't think that people like the decision, but that it's all history now. So, uh, so yeah, so they, now, so, that's yeah so, they, so they pulled out. But what it did was it made us, we then went to everybody else and we said, look, are you, are you, you know, is there, is there a problem here? And they said, well, look, you know, we've got this issue and that issue and the other issue. So what we did was we did a massive reset of the, of the whole platform. So we made it much more, we, we listened to what they were saying really. And we did four or five quite big things. So without getting into too much detail, one of the things they were saying to us was, as the industry has evolved, all your different categories now are kind of blending into one so that we can enter the same piece of work into loads of categories, which is costing us a fortune. So we came up with an idea saying, look, why don't we cap the number of categories you can enter? So everyone's on a level playing field. So there's a cap to how many entries you have to put in. And they appreciated that. So there were things like that that we had to change and pivot, which has been really good. And did that initially have a big impact on your bottom line? Yeah, we had a tough, we had a tough year the following year. Uh, but it was worth it because I think, I think what it said was that the industry, to the the they felt we'd listen to them, which mm. is which was the most important thing. So, so what did happen? They they pulled out. Yeah, they pulled out. I mean, they tried. Year. They didn't pull out completely. You know, there's still some people that came and some people entered, and it's very hard to control a massive organisation like that. Yeah. But they pulled but effectively. Let's say they pulled out, and then the following year, as they promised, they were really clear. It's like this is only one year. It's not like we're never coming back. And the next year they came back. Okay. So like the taxi drivers, they went on strike. For yeah. a year, yeah, they went on strike. And for came a year. and yeah. came back. So, how did you turn it around then? You you had a difficult year financially that year. Mm. What did you do to to turn turn it around? We had a public reset. I say public. It was for the core customers. What is it you are not happy with? How can we change it to to your benefit? What are your key problems? You know, what is your most, what are the things that are really bothering you? And how can we try and help you to address that? And that was really, really worth doing. And so that's how we 
that's how we turned it down. Ash, what do you think the lesson in that story is for a business owner or entrepreneur or anyone in business? I'd say I feel like losses can be a great opportunity to refocus and reform your offering, especially when you have clients and their satisfaction that can then allow them to, you know, be a be a consistent client of yours for many years to come. Yeah, yeah. And I think people talk about customers a lot, but being genuinely close to your customers is absolutely critical, I think. Yeah. Which means having conversations with them and being really open. Yeah, for sure. So you're not, you didn't stay as, so you're a CEO of Canlines. Yeah. For how long? 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. And did you decide I want to do something different? Did an opportunity come up? How did things change? I felt I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve. First point. Second point, somebody else has got to have a go at it. You know, it's a great job. It's like best job in the world. And I do feel strongly you can't just hoard these things. So I felt fresh thinking, somebody new, give somebody else an opportunity. I've done it 10 years. That's quite a long time. Um, so I just felt it was time to move up. And in the meantime, there was an offer to take over some other businesses. And so I'm CEO of some other businesses now as well as can lions what what was that when you say there was an offer to take over some other business do they post it on the internal news you know room that there's a new job available how does it work for those interested in that well you mentioned before about the fact that i've been at this business now for my whole career basically it has changed a lot and in that career in that career i've probably had something in the region of uh counted it up the other day what was it about 24 different jobs over that period. And of those jobs, I should think half have been given to me, as in, we've got this role, do you want it? Mm -hmm. And about half I've had to apply for. Mm -hmm. That's roughly the ratio. And this particular occasion, I was running Cam Lions. They said, look, we've got lots of other businesses. You've been doing this 10 years. <clears throat> You've told us you want to do something different. We've got a portfolio role for you to, mm -hmm. to run to run these businesses. And who's they? What kind of positions are they? The, which the other mag the, the other businesses. The people saying that you So this was the chief executive in the board. I yeah. see. Okay. okay. Chief executive of Essential. Of Essential. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the opportunity comes up, how do you how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean it goes back to something I said if anybody's still listening from earlier on, uh that was then that that squished middle job. Mm. Right, so I was reporting to the proper CEO and I was running products that were being run by proper business leaders. Mm. So it is that squished middle. So you've then got to work out, well, what what is the point of me then? So what I did was... And you I, knew this at this time, you were about to go into a, a squish position. Yeah, call it. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the hardest one, but I thought, well, what can I do that nobody else can do? Well, I can do M&A, so I sold a load of our businesses. I bought some businesses. Um, and I just tried to wait it out, so to speak, a little yeah. bit and just see see what would happen. But it's it's a really interesting role because you're very responsible for all the revenues and all the profits and everything. Uh, but you haven't got that much power to really influence things. Mm. So you just have to get your head in the right place. So that's what you did to kind of focus on what you're yeah. good at. I, I, you took your advice earlier and you, you focused on M&As. Yeah. What did you sell and why, why did you sell it and how did that affect the business? So I was given a whole load of um, exhibition businesses, trade businesses, which are a very different model from the ones that, things like Can Lions. Um, and I just didn't like the, I didn't like the business model um, for lots of reasons. And I didn't feel they were going to go anywhere. So my recommendation was that we sold them and we did sell them in the end for quite a good price. So this is what you're doing in terms of that partnership with the, yeah, with the exactly. CEOs. You're saying... You know, let me take this off your hand or here's some ideas that I think will work great. Yeah. And there with their all, all the things they have to do. Okay, great. That sounds like a good strategy. Yeah. That's right. That. That's right. Yeah. And so what's the, the the path to becoming so what was your role then? What was the title? So I was chief executive of Essential Futures, so to speak, which was a collection of businesses, including Can Lions. And now what we're doing is splitting the business and I'm gonna become the CEO of the PLC. And um and that's a whole other, totally, 
totally different job. Even in all the years that I've reported to CEOs, I've never really understood w what the job is. I just uh, it's like, oh God, that's the job. Blimey, really? That's quite hard. <laughs> and it's amazing. I had no idea. There's a whole thing that you don't realize. So you're going through this right now. Yeah, going through, I'm learning right now. Yeah, amazing. You know, one of the things I'd say to people is um, just going back to again. I've I've learned things quite late in my career, and I was telling you about some of the lessons that I've learned. They've really come quite late in my career. Yeah. And actually, I've I I worked something out only within the last ten years, which is the importance of understanding your own values. So, just to put that into a bit of context, a lot of people go away and they have away days at Wallace Space, and they talk about the values of the company, don't they? And company values are like a really big thing. And what interests me was actually. People don't spend that much time thinking about their own values. And I went through a process, was helped by a coach, actually. So it's, my advice would be to get somebody else to talk to you about this. And really, really examine what you stand for and what's important to you. Because if you can then use that as a kind of guiding principle, it can really help you in your decisions. And it also helps you in understanding your relationship with other people as well and why you act the way you act. If you truly understand what, what is very deep within you, it also explains to you why you get bored about sometimes you're bored, sometimes you're, in, you're enthused. Often we don't know why that is, but I think if you really understand your values, things suddenly become quite clear. So, a couple of examples of that. So when I went through the process, I came up with a number of words that I, that I realized were incredibly important to me. And one of those words was fairness. And this goes very deep. You, you can go quite deep. So I, I was going quite deep back into my childhood and stuff like that. So fairness was one of them. And what I realized was when I completely overreact, in certain situations, quite often it's because I think the other person isn't being fair, mm. either to other people or, being really honest, to me. So if I feel they're not being fair to me, mm. I really react, overreact. And you can understand yourself much better. But then you also realize, I actually only want to be in an environment that is trying to be fair. Because if I'm not, I'm not going to be happy. So that long preamble, I suppose, is to tee up the fact that in my current position, I'm learning a lot because learning is another of my values. So I can't be in an environment where I'm not learning. Yeah. So the fact that I'm really ancient, but I'm still, I'm learning this whole world of what it is to be CEO of a PLC is very, very energizing. And I understand why it's energizing because learning is really important to me. Mm. So young people, if you can spend time digging into what your values are, it will stand you in such amazing stead in the future because it will, I mean, we do it for our brands, don't we? So with Can Lions, for instance, one of the values of Can Lions is it's global. And the reason we use that word is to keep us honest about things because we're based in London and it could be very easy to be really, really UK centric. Mm. But 10% of our business is the UK and the rest is from the rest of the world. So that goes to the language we use and you know how we talk about things and what angle we're coming from. All our communi communications and our basic worldview has to be global. Mm, yeah. So that value gives you a, a north star to help you make decisions. And it's the same with people, the same with human beings, ourselves. Yeah. Um, so if I, if I could beseech young people to do that as a ask a friend ask a partner a parent so I, I think this is do you feel this is important to me as well because i'm getting to this word that i believe is part of me as a human being do you do you see that in myself you, know, you can get help from other people to build yeah. it out and it's really really useful and not just young people you know a lot of people watching listening this are in an md role 
yeah their head of department their directors wanting to you know learn about the transition to ceo or c-suite and i think this the same applies there yeah um and speaking of which so you're going through this process of learning what it's like to be a ceo of a, of a publicly listed company and essential is a FTSE 250 company revenues over 500 million annually what are you learning about this next role that would what what does it involve being a CEO of a, of a publicly listed company? Well, I think the first big thing is that you've spent your entire career basically with two groups of stakeholders, your people and your customers. And suddenly there's an equally important third group, which is the investors. Mm. And I'm sure this is true of entrepreneurs and you know people that are scaling up and starting up and all the rest of it. But when you're in a corporate, you don't have to think about the investors because somebody else thinks about that. It turns out it's the CEO that thinks about that <laughs> and the CFO. So suddenly you go from 50-50 staff and customers to 33 and a third, 33 and a third, and you've got this bunch of investors. And then you have to think, God, how am I going to get somebody to invest in this business? What are the weaknesses? What are the strengths? How can I persuade them? The story that you tell um, is really important. And what I think has changed in the last few years is that I think a lot of CEOs had a different story for each of those groups. Mm. So they'd have one story for their people and one story for their customers. They'd have another story for their investors. What I think is changing is that CEOs now are telling, are having to tell the same story to all of those stakeholders. Because that's that? all, well, because they're all interested. They're starting to become interested in some subjects that are common to all of them so for instance you know esg sustainability mm -hmm. diversity inclusion how you are as a company how you behave as a company this is really important to staff but actually customers and investors are also taking this really seriously as well and i think it's i think that's one reason why marketers have got a real opportunity or communicators mm -hmm. have got a real opportunity to sit next to the CEO and help them with this narrative because CEOs aren't really used to it. They're like, they're used to saying, okay, Mr. Investor or Mrs. Investor, you're interested in revenue and profit and all in you know, a margin and dividends and stuff. But actually the narrative now has to be so much more joined up. And that's where I think that marketers can help, communicators can help. So um, you're, you've been a CEO for a little while now. What are some things that you do as a CEO that if you weren't to do them would have a big impact on how you're able to perform in, in your role? And these might be how you manage your time, key meetings you have, numbers that you look at. What would you say are, are some of those? Well, I had two pieces of advice when I started one is a sort of conceptual idea, which is, you know, how should you be when you're the CEO? And the best bit of advice or the thing that stuck with me was you need to be in the midst of it, but not the center of it, mm. which I thought was absolute genius because you've got to be in the midst of your business, but you can't be the center of it because there are so much, so much talent in there that's running it. You don't want to be in the center of it. You don't want to be the one making every single decision. Mm. But to be in the midst of it is critically important. So I think that's part of it. And then the other bit of advice that really resonated was what can only you do? Be really, really clear on what only you can do. Because there are things that only you can do. So yeah. what are those things? And so that might be well, only I can really set what kind of, what values I want for this company. Yeah. Only I can do that. Only I can decide if I want everybody in the organization to be a shareholder. Mm -hmm. Only I can decide if I want to move to four days a week. That's, you know, that's part of it. What else can only I do? Well, o only I can really tell the story with passion to the investors 
only I can probably decide on a big piece of acquisition. So what are the things that only you can do? And if you if you get if you get clear on that, then you don't spend your time irritating everybody by micromanaging them. Maybe uh, an interesting question is what what are the things that you you know your is not your strong area, and how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but I think you've just got to get people who understand it around you. So I've got strategy people in my business who are so much, they're just so much smarter than I am. You know, they just get stuff so much quicker. And actually they, they don't only get it quicker, but they, they're, there's stuff that they get that I never get, just don't understand it. And then there are finance people, obviously. That's not anybody's strong suit unless you are a finance person. They just understand the depth of what they understand is phenomenal. So I think leaning on people who really fill those gaps for you are criti- is really critical. And how do you work with your finance person? Like, what's what have you found works really well? Did certain conversations you have, certain meetings? Again, for someone who's listening, maybe in this role, who wants to know, actually, yeah, I'm great at other things, but that area. I think the relationship with finance is you can't really overstate how important it is. Because there's two sides to the coin. The first side is finance must never, ever run the business. <laughs> um, because they're trained and their job is is not the same as yours. You know, your job is to take risks. Your job is to grow the business. Your job is stuff that finance sometimes find quite uncomfortable. So they must never run it. But they've really got to be there to support you and and help you and tell you where you might be going wrong and tell you what's important and have you seen this thing over here you better watch out for that so it's a really really the relationship between the ceo and the cfo is so so important and they've got it's got to be a real understanding you know just to be clear you don't run the business i run the business but i appreciate everything you can do to help me do that do you remember a time where you went against the advice or opinion of your CFO and what, what that was? Yeah, it, it has happened a lot. It's happened a lot. It's usually about costs. So it's usually about spending some something. Any um, examples? I mean, CFOs, and this is a very generalization. I'm not talking specifically about anybody that I'm, I'm working with now, but yeah. CFOs, broadly speaking, want to maximize profit in the year. And that's that's their role. It's their really. role. Yeah, they're very they're cost orientated. Yeah, yeah. So if you say, well, look, I, I really honestly think it's worth spending a hundred and fifty thousand quid on a conference mm-hmm. to get everyone together from all over the world, so that I can paint my majestic vision <laughs> for the business, they're like, are you sure we should do that? <laughs> so you have to sometimes just say, well, yeah, I am actually, I am sure, I'm sure we should do that. Uh, but it's a really interesting relationship because you're right, that is their job. Are you Are you someone, would you say you're a decisive person? Are you? How are you in those scenarios where you've got to go against the, you know, wants and desires of a member of your C-suite who's super, you know, very good at what they do, super intelligent, and you have to make a decision to do something different? How are you with that? Well, I think when it comes to sort of opinions about things, my dad taught me something really really good right when I was really young which is when you're having an argument with someone just stop and think for one minute they could be 100% right Mm. that is such good advice Mm. they could be do you know what they could be 100% right so I always spend a lot of time asking questions it's partly my journalistic background Mm. and actually I've been criticized for this I've been told off for this in what way? What well, I've got a, so when I'm moving into this CEO role, I've got a couple of mentors, and I have been told you've got to stop asking so many questions. Do you agree? Well, I'll go a bit further. I mean, one of my mentors said you must never go into a situation where you're asking a question that you do not know the answer to. Now, I think it's quite tough. Yeah, well, I think he's one. right in certain circumstances. So I think there are circumstances, so it could be a board meeting maybe or a very high level investor meeting where you asking some random question that you don't know the answer to 
could open up a massive can of worms. And it's, all, it's almost political. It's almost like this is how politicians act. And I can really understand the danger of doing that. So I think there are circumstances where you have to be very controlled and you have to give the impression of total dominance of your, your domain. You don't need to ask any questions. Mm. And also you should never ask a question you don't know the answer to because it makes you look like you don't know what the hell you're doing. Yeah. I can get that. But I'm not going to stop asking questions because I actually think asking questions is a really good way to find, to get to the truth. Yeah. So I, I ask probably too many. I mean, it's probably quite annoying, but I just keep asking stuff because I'm really, well, partly because I'm really keen to learn, but actually I just genuinely want to understand more. And then I think you can make a decision. And then once I've made that decision, I'm quite, I'm pretty decisive actually. Because I don't believe there's anything I honestly don't think there are no real bad decisions. There's just decisions that you live with and work with. I like that. I like that. And do you think that advice is based on the new role you're heading into where it's there's a difference in being a CEO? I mean, there's obviously different grades of CEO. You can be a CEO of an organization, organization with 20 people and you can be a CEO of an organization with a lot more. You can be a CEO of a not publicly listed and a public. Is that advice more tailored towards the role you're going into, do you think? Uh, I think to an extent, because I think if you're a CEO of a business with 20 people, what you're probably doing is running a, pre you've probably got one product, I would guess. Mm. So you're more like a product owner, and I think you should act like a product owner. Mm. Um, it is different on the public markets. Like I said, you've got a different audience. And also everything's so public. I mean, every single, you're judged every day on the share price. It's like, whose fault is that if the share price goes down? Um, that's the other piece of advice I've been given, which is do not look at the share price because, <laughs> you know, it's going to go up and down. And if you beat yourself up every day when it goes down. So, so I do think it's slightly different depending on the scale of it. But I think, uh, I think that advice is quite good. I think the advice about w what is it that only you can do, I think is probably the best piece of advice. And that's why my next question is, is we talked about, you know, areas where you get support in, you get amazing people in. What are you amazing at? What do you feel, feel is, the, is the strengths that you bring to the organization you're at? Um, I think I'm quite creative, so I'm quite good at coming up with new ideas and stuff. But I think probably the, the thing, and I think it's partly because, I think it's something to do with the way my mind is geared. But I'm actually quite good at seeing the landscape in front of me i think if I, if I was if i had one thing that maybe is quite strong it would be that it was like I, I can see so i could see where it was going with magazines i could see i could just see i can just see the way that so it's a bit like when chat gpt really hit the headlines in december we've had all sorts of false dawns we've had vr we've had ar there's, there's loads of things that are going to change the world completely. And I'm quite good at kind of working out what's and what's not. So I think that's, that's quite a good skill to have. If you just raise your head a little bit and have a look forward and just think, hmm, where's everything going? Which, which direction are things going? That sort of seeing how trends and how things are going in the future, do you think that is related to your dyslexia? Yeah, I do actually, yeah. It's really a, you know, it's a superpower. Yeah. It amazes me sometimes how short-sighted people can be. Um, they can't seem to see the results of their actions. They can't mm. seem to see the outcome that for me is often really clear. So I think that's, I think it's quite useful when you, especially in our world, in media and God, it's all changing so much, isn't it? What do you think the lesson for people listening with? Maybe they've been told they're dyslexic. I feel like a lot of your story has been around following what you love and the rest will fall into place. Yeah. And I feel like that would be the same message out there to someone who's got dyslexia or any kind of challenge that is seen a certain way. It's to follow your own path. Don't listen to anybody else. Because once you, as long as you keep going on your path, the right people, the right circumstances, the right environment will find you. That's right. I completely agree with that. And I would say to anyone listening, if you find yourself tired or bored or lacking in inspiration at work, 
lacking in energy, it's because you're doing the wrong thing. Mm. And we are at work for a very, very, very long time, for many, many decades. Mm. And then during every day, most of our day. Mm. So you might as well try to do something you enjoy. Yeah. I think, don't you? Yeah, for sure. It's easy to say, really easy to say, because it's harder to do. But my God, that is so true. Because yeah, otherwise you end up, your, your whole life's gone by and you think, God, I didn't even enjoy it. Yeah, I think that element of resilience through the journey as well. As you said, there's many times where it's like taking a sidestep or maybe even a downstep for a moment. But to be resilient enough to sit there, bide your time, and then the next thing will come come to you. Yeah. But it's in those moments where there's fear, there's anxiety, there's all sorts of emotions that go around in your head. But if you listen to your like, kind of inner guidance to say, you know what, I'll do this for a moment, I'll wait it out, hmm. then that patience pays off. Yeah, you know, I'm quite a late, as we've discussed, I'm quite a late developer and I got proper anxiety really recently, mm -hmm. like less than 10 years ago, proper what I now know is proper anxiety. Mm. And I would never wish that on anyone. And my empathy for people with anxiety went through the roof because I was like, oh, that's what it's like. Mm. But as I was coming out of it, I was I listened to Johnny Wilkinson being interviewed, you know, the rugby player. Mm -hmm. And he has been racked with anxiety his whole life. And I know it's simple to say, but he said the thing that unlocked it for him was with anxiety, of course, what you're worried about is like everything's going to go wrong. And he's just woke up one day and thought, everything's been okay so far. And today it's okay. So the chances of it being okay in the future are really high. And I know it's so easy to say that, but conceptually, I think it's so clever. Because it's like, let's just think about this as a, as a, the chances of anything happening. I've been okay up until now. It's probably likely I'm going to be okay in the future, no matter what happens. And I think if I could have told myself that, like when I was unemployed or sidelined or booted out of this job or that job, I think it would really, really have helped me. I know if you're, su and apologies if you are suffering anxiety, somebody listening to this, it sounds really trite, but that unlocked something for me as well. Love that. So as, uh, Someone who's been part of Canlines, one of the great awards in advertising. You must have some great advice about entering awards. What would you say to people listening, watching? Oh, I just think you've got to put yourself, it's a bit like creating anything. You've got to think about the audience. Who's the audience? The audience is the jury. Hmm. How are you going to tell your story to the jury? They've got millions of other pieces of work to look at and you've got to track their attention. So it's a piece of marketing, really. It's like, what is the story of your entry and how can you capture their attention? And it's amazing, really, because Canlines is obviously entered by advertising, marketing people. You'd be surprised how bad they are at telling their own story. But that's what it's about. It's like, just imagine, if you're entering Can particularly, you've got 10 people in a room, there's probably no windows. It's really hot and sunny outside. And they can probably just about hear the tinkling of champagne glasses as people have a drink on a yacht somewhere. <laughs> and they're sitting in the dark watching award entries. How are you going to make them feel good? <laughs> How are you going to tell your story so they think, wow. Well, I've got an idea, Ash. We'll do an award entry and we'll say, go have a five minute break. We won't tell this in, <laughs> in, the, in the app, in the yeah. post. That's a good idea. Take a five minute break. Yeah. Just give us at least a bronze. Yeah. <laughs> Just at least or take bronze. 10 minutes and give us a gold. Yeah. All right. That's what we're going to do. I like that. I'm behind what that. What does Can Lions look like in 20 years time? We've always tried to remain relevant and change and adapt. So whatever the industry is going to look like in 20 years is what Can Lions will look like. Hopefully. What do you think it'll adapt be? What do you think the industry will look like? Well, I think there's always going to be a need to communicate brand messages or organizational messages. Yeah. And it's just a question of how you communicate them. So it used to be 30 second ads and now it's everything from in-game advertising to God knows what else. And I think as that morphs and changes, then I think it'll be uh, hopefully the festival will 
adapt as well. And over the years, Ashley and I have brought industry leaders together, talk about big industry challenges, more importantly, talk about the solutions in roundtables and things like this. What do you think is the importance of the industry putting competition aside and unifying together to, to work together on industry problems. One of the great things about CanLines is that it brings all of these creative people together. And they are so willing to give their creativity to help to solve the world's problems. And we've done partnerships with the Gates Foundation, the United Nations, and numerous other people like that. And the reason it's so powerful is because we haven't talked much about creativity, but that's a whole other podcast. But creativity, human creativity, can move us forward. It can progress us as a species. And it can do great things and really powerful things. And the, the most amazing thing is that our community, our industry, is really up for trying to help, using their creativity to help. And that's just really inspiring. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree with with that. Um, okay, that is the story of how you became CEO of Essential and a chair of CanLines. Uh, we'll do a final piece where we share what we learned from your story. And I think we've got some off the, off the hot press uh, <laughs> poem words for, for your story. But before that, we'll give you a moment to set up. Um, I think what's amazing about your story is, you know, you've, you went through a really tough time at school, it sounds like, dealing with this challenge. And at that point, you don't know what it is. You just, things aren't working. You're not succeeding in this world of school and academic. You go do photography college thinking, this is oh, finally, I found what I'm good at. That doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. You didn't give up. You didn't go, well, this life isn't for me. You kept working, kept working, learned how to spell, even though it was really difficult. And you just seem to have had that attitude throughout your whole career. Again, when you got sidelined, mm. you could have just gone, oh, I had, had a great career and now I don't. But re-strategize, use that time, thought about how you're gonna change things and did something about it. It happened again. You know, you did something about it and you've got, it seems that this great ability to go, I won't let this challenge, you know, stop me. I'm going to keep, keep going, keep persevering, which I think is an amazing life lesson for people that you, that mindset can get you so far. It's got you to where you are. You saw Cannes Lines was not as popular as Cannes Film Festival. And you thought, right, we need to have so many people. I can't see Chanel anymore. <laughs> and you've gone and done it, you know, and I think there's a amazing yeah, life lessons from there. Massive congratulations for all the work you've done and with the many great people, I'm sure to make can lines what it is, which is m massive for the industry, gives a lot of people credibility for amazing work that they do. And I'm sure you, you, you know, changes careers. Someone wins a can line, that's something they can talk about for the rest of their career and help them up. So yeah, huge life lessons there. And uh, look forward to what's next on your, your journey with Essential and um, more bar barriers broken down, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. Oh, we're happy to have you here. It's been a great story. And I think we can see from your story that you can do whatever you want, even if your brain is differently wired. Rekindling the love for the craft of advertising and media, creating a festival that leaves people inspired. <laughs> As you move up within your industry or career, it's important to find a coach or a sounding board and to always remember to think about your audience if you're ever going to submit an award. Now, I'm looking forward to next month when we get on the plane and fly to France and not Spain, but always remembering in our work and career to be a radiator and not a drain. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Nice, written while we were recording. While we were that recording, while we were recording. Good. And I hope all of these conversations will go and sit deep within your brain Stay locked in and subscribe for the next episode of How I Became. Very good. God, you did that on the hoof. On the hoof. I think Ash should <laughs> do a poem at Cannes one day. Cannes yeah, Lines. Yeah. Let's make that happen.